My name is Liz Ranchkowski. I'm a content specialist at Mihai. Um, I'll try to walk you through uh, an introduction to MIPS, um, the merit-based, uh, excuse me, merit-based incentive payment system. Um, this is kind of the next chapter as we move forward with integration of health IT and moving toward a performance-based payment system, um, measuring the use of health IT, and then determining your reimbursements, particularly through Medicare. Um, based on your performance in those, uh, those areas. So we have a packed agenda, but we'll try to get through it um, as quickly as possible and leave plenty of time for Q&A. As Brendan mentioned, this is a relatively new program and we're learning right along with you. Um, MACRA, which is the legislation that introduced MIPS. Um, MACRA is the Medicare. <laughs> oh, bear with me. Oh, I can't. <laughs> I know I do have it here. Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act. Uh, but MACRA is the legislation that did uh, introduce MIPS, and that was released just in April of 2015. So this is all relatively new. CMS is still engaging in soliciting stakeholder input um, and seeking feedback from the provider community to uh, roll out some key elements of MIPS. So they're still developing some proposed rules that will implement um, as I mentioned, some of the key elements of, of MIPS. And so if you have a question today that we can't answer, um, please bear with us. We'll try to find an answer if there's one out there and uh, certainly get back to you. But as I said, it's a good learning experience for us as well because uh, we're learning this right along with you. So um, we'll touch upon the current health IT landscape. As most of you know, um, the health IT initiatives and quality reporting programs that currently exist create a complex and ever-shifting, ever-evolving landscape for all of you. Um, and this requires a lot of change to your clinical and office workflows. Um, there's obviously, as it says there at the bottom, um, consequences of non-compliance with these initiatives. Um, I love that ICD-10 and CMS administrative simplification initiatives because I love that terminology, administrative <laughs> simplification. <laughs> Uh, I think it's anything but simple <laughs> to implement a lot of these things, so um, I think that's sort of a misnomer. But uh, but as you know, it's it's complex, it's ever shifting, it's ever changing, it's ever evolving, and so um, CMS has said that they're trying to sort of streamline and simplify to whatever extent they can um, some of these programs, and basically they're going to use that shift and, and that streamlining process to uh, both revise existing payment models and also improve the quality of care um, to the extent that they can. So again, it's about that shift away from fee-for-service and toward pay-for-performance. Um, but then the question becomes, well, how do you evaluate a provider's performance? So MIPS is kind of where that's at. Um, as I mentioned, the legislative background behind this whole thing is the Medicare Access and CHIP Reauthorization Act, um, signed into law in April 2015. Um, it replaces the sustainable growth rate with this revised reimbursement model contains some other provisions as you can see there, but the bottom line for the purpose of this presentation today is that MACRA will change how Medicare uh, pays physicians and other healthcare providers. So again, MACRA, uh, MACRA excuse me, replaces that sustainable growth rate with a combination of payment adjustments and incentives for providers who participate in pay for performance and alternative payment models. Um, Thomas is gonna touch upon the alternative payment models and what those look like um, in a later part of the presentation. Um, but again, MACRA is designed to sort of improve upon that SGR methodology. Um, and that last point there, that it's designed to promote quality of care over quantity and volume, again, um, alludes to that idea that we're moving away from fee-for-service and toward pay-for-performance. And we just need to figure out how we're gonna measure performance and what that measurement's gonna look like. I did wanna mention here too that MACRA does provide some provisions for folks who work in smaller practices. So they define a small practice as 15 or fewer providers. And it also provides some provisions for providers in health professional shortage areas, or HPSAs. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more later in the presentation, but I know it talks on this slide about physicians in high quality efficient practices may benefit financially. Well, what if I don't work in a high quality efficient practice? What if I'm struggling with some of this stuff, right? So there are some provisions within MACRA that um, help smaller providers. Again, they define that as 15 or fewer providers. Um, and folks who work in um, health professional shortage areas and 
um, you know, high risk, high need areas. So let's talk about what the reimbursement rates look like through MACRA. So for 2015, to 2015 through 2019, um, the annual increase, the fee schedule update that we're familiar with of 0.5%, that continues. But starting in 2019, uh, that 0.5% increase is phased out. So your base reimbursement rate holds steady. Um, <clears throat> like it says here, physicians can supplement their reimbursement through participation in VIPs or in uh, AC or APMs, excuse me, um, such as ACOs. The APM incentive payment is a 5% lump sum that's available from 2019 to 2024. And the MIPS payment adjustments, based on your composite score, and we'll talk about what the composite score is in a moment, um, increase from plus or minus 4% to plus or minus 9% over the course of a few years. And it's important to note that that's a plus or minus. So it kind of works similar to the um, existing value modifier PQRS programs where it can be a plus or minus depending on your performance compared to your peers. Um, and then starting in 2026, that annual increase uh, reappears, it reemerges, and it is actually a 0.75% increase for people who are, are participating in an APM, and then a 0.25 increase for everybody else. So the bottom line here is that the MIPS payment adjustments are going to um, replace that automatic increase of 0.5% beginning in 2019. And what that means for all of you is that um, because those MIPS payment adjustments begin in 2019, the performance year that that's going to be based on is 2017. So that's coming up quicker than I think some people may have realized. Um, we're practically in 2016 as it is, so it really is only a year um, to kind of get your ducks in a row and get ready for MIPS. The good news is that a lot of this is based on existing programs, and we'll talk about that. So let's talk a little bit about the timeline. Um, this, when I first saw it, looked overwhelming, and I was like, what is all this? Uh, so we'll walk through it line by line so it's not quite so daunting. So uh, that first line refers to the fee schedule update that I was just talking about. Um, that 0.5% that, uh, excuse me, remains until uh, 2019. And then um, it reappears in 2026 as a 0.75 increase for anybody that's in an APM and a 0.25% increase for everybody else. Um, the middle line is MIPS, which is what I'll focus on from here on out. Um, it may be difficult for you to read. Hopefully you can read those yellow lines there. But MIPS is based on four categories. Uh, quality, resource use, clinical practice improvement, and meaningful use of certified EHR. And again, those percentages that you see there that begin in 2019 are plus or minus. Um, and it does increase as much as not, up, up to 9%, which is pretty significant. The bottom line there is for APMs, or alternative payment models, and again, Thomas will talk a little bit more about that in a few moments, um, but that includes the lump sum incentive payment of uh, 5%. And if you do participate successfully in an APM, you are excluded from MIPS, so it's kind of an either-or um, deal where you can either choose to participate in MIPS or choose to participate in an APM and be excluded from MIPS. <coughs> So again, uh, as you know, the existing programs like PQRS, Value Modifier, MU, have that two-year delay from your performance year to your payment year. Um, and again, it's anticipated that 2017 would be the first MIPS performance year, um, which would dictate your 2019 payment adjustments. Um, CMS will further define these details in a final rule. So as I mentioned, they're currently seeking stakeholder input and trying to um, draft these proposed rules. And then there will, there will be, in keeping with their previous practices, a public comment period on the proposed rule, and then they'll come out with a final rule that takes into account those public comments and questions that do come in. Uh, for stage three MU, which is optional in 2017, mandatory in 2018, um, it's interesting to note that's gonna be measured solely under the MIPS program. So there will be no standalone Medicare MU penalties beginning in 2018. Um, and again, the final rule will address a couple of things. Um, notably here, that final rule will address how group performance and individual performance will affect MIPS scores. So the final rule will address how group performance and individual performance are going to be integrated. Because it says here, um, components of MIPS currently vary in that regard. So 
As many of you know, PQRS is Value Modifier Support Group Reporting. So you can report your PQRS measures through what they call the Group Practice Reporting Option, or GPRO. Um, but NU evaluates performance on an individual provider level. So even though you can consolidate your Medicaid um, payment, uh, patient volume threshold data and report as a group in terms of your Medicaid patient volume threshold, the NU measures are evaluated based on individual provider performance. So one of the questions that's sort of lingering in the air is how will MIPS consolidate those two different types of reporting? Um, and even beyond that, the question came up today, well, who's going to oversee MIPS? Is there going to be a sort of a unified governing body within CMS that's going to oversee MIPS, or is it going to remain sort of siloed programs for people? Um, and that still remains to be seen as well, so we'll see. But basically the question becomes, what's the extent of the integration? Is it going to remain these individualized silo programs where they just take your performance within those programs and create a composite score? Or will there be a, a more integrated approach in terms of <clears throat> your reporting mechanisms and also who oversees this program? So basically MIPS integrates three existing programs. PQRS, as I mentioned, the Value Modifier and the EHR Incentive Payment Program, or MU. Um, and again, for the 2015 and 2016 performance years and their respective payment years, those three programs will continue as separate and distinct uh, programs. But again, the question is, what's the extent of the integration after that? So we'll see. Um, the list of eligible professionals that you see there um, for the first two years of MIPS, it looks a lot like the current list of eligible professionals for meaningful use. Um, but for the third year and beyond, that list expands to include um, folks who are currently uh, eligible for PQRS and value modifiers, so the list gets quite a bit longer. Again, you have that either or option, so EPs can either participate in MIPS or be a qualifying participant or QP, and that's a new term they're sort of introducing here, in an alternative payment model. <laughs> um, EPs who do participate in MIPS, again, receive those payment adjustments, positive, negative, or neutral based on their composite performance score. Um, if you receive a high composite performance score, obviously you're eligible for incentive. If you receive a low composite, com composite score, um, you're subject to payment penalties. And then on a yearly basis, the QPs, the people that participate in an APM, um, as we talked about earlier, will receive a 5% lump sum incentive payment. The composite score is based on four categories. Again, as I talked about, quality, resource use, clinical practice improvement, and MU and there again you see the possible um, payment adjustment ranges. So just to touch upon what's involved in your MIPS composite performance score, um, the four categories as you see there are weighted. So basically you get a score from zero to 100, um, but your performance again in each category is weighted um, so that quality and resource use make up together 60% of your MIPS composite performance score um, we'll talk about that in a few moments, how that kind of uh, is heavily weighted toward PQRS and value modifiers that currently exist. And then NU makes up 25%, and as you can see, that new, the new-ish category of clinical practice improvement makes up 15%. Um, I should mention here, too, that the weights can be adjusted, so CMS does have that discretion or that flexibility to adjust these weights if people are performing particularly well in a particular performance category. Um, they can reduce the weight of that category and vice versa. If there's one they want to take a closer look at, they can increase the weight of that category. So they've kind of built some flexibility wisely into the, into the law. Oops. So let's look particularly at uh, each component of the composite score. The first one being quality, which looks a lot like what we currently know as PQRS. So it'll include quality measures currently uh, used in existing programs like Value Modifier and PQRS. Um, also the clinical quality measures that are currently used in MU. Um, they may include uh, measures currently used by uh, QCDRs or qualified clinical data registries. And then here's a good example where CMS is soliciting uh, stakeholder feedback. You know, additional measures might be added um, based on feedback from professional organizations and others in the healthcare community. So, the idea here is that ultimately, to the extent that it's feasible, um, 
the final list of measures will include measures from all six of the current NQS domains that you see listed there. Resource use looks a lot like what we currently know as value modifier. So this is where your performance on the quality measures is compared against your cost or what you're billing to Medicare. So for those that aren't familiar, the value modifier um, provides differential payment to physicians under the uh, physician fee schedule based on the quality of care furnished, so that's your performance on the quality measures, compared to the cost of care during a particular performance period. And basically it makes sense. High quality care at a low cost results in an upward payment adjustment. Low quality care at a high cost uh, results in a downward payment adjustment. Um, they do talk about how resource use measures, again, will be um, enhanced through public input. There'll be an additional process that directly engages professionals um, to try and come up with, uh, you know, how this is actually going to be operationalized and implemented. And the idea here is those bottom two that um, providers are not um, penalized for serving a sicker or more costly patient. Um, you know, so they're, they're able to report on the type of treatment and the condition of the patient, again, so they're not penalized for treating a, you know, a more costly or sicker patient. So this uh, clinical practice improvement category is probably the least defined of the four categories at this point. Um, it basically includes things like expanded practice access, population management care coordination, as you see here. Um, expanded practice access includes things like um, same day appointments, extended hours, basically things that make it easier for patients to see their provider. <clears throat> um, care coordination is similar to the care coordination activities currently lined, uh, outlined in the NQS domain of care coordination. So things like med reconciliation, transitions of care, HIE, things like that. Um, as it mentions here, EPs who work in a patient-centered medical home or comparable specialty practice, and CMS has to define exactly what that means. Um, will receive the maximum score of 15, and then EPs who participate in an APM will receive a minimum score of 7.5, so they can receive no lower than a 7.5 in this category. And last but not least, meaningful use of CERT, and not surprisingly, this looks a lot like what we currently know as meaningful use. Um, the measures and activities are the same as the current MU requirements. Um, and this second bullet point there is a good example of what I was talking about before, how CMS can adjust the weights of the categories. So um, CMS can reduce the weight of the meaningful use category, but not below 15% in any year in which the proportion of EPs who are meaningful users is 75% or greater. Um, and that obviously would result in the um, increase in the percentage weight for the other categories. And I also wanted to make mention while I'm on this slide about the meaningful use final rule. So um, for those of you that attended the session earlier or you're familiar with the um, 2015 final rule, the goal is basically for everyone to be um, on the same page and reporting the stage three objectives by 2018. And I think the idea behind that when it relates to MIPS is that um, if everyone's reporting on stage three in 2018, it makes it easier to evaluate people's performance and compare performance against um, you know, that of your peers. I'm going to turn it over to Thomas to talk more about alternative payment models. As Liz stated, you saw earlier, uh, within MACRA, you, uh, providers have a choice of participating in MIPS or an alternative payment model. Uh, so we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, what those look like. Uh, you can see right off the top here just uh, an eligible uh, alternative payment model entity and what that would look like, of course, it's going to require the participants to uh, have a certified EHR. Uh, provides payment uh, for covered professionals based on quality measures. And this is comparable to uh, MIPS uh, in terms of the uh, measures. So again, this is just reinforcing the movement from the fee-for-service to performance-based models in terms of our reporting. Uh, and then here, uh, either requires participants to bear uh, some financial risk or uh, for monetary losses uh, under that APM. So, and you can see, in the, you know, you're familiar with examples of uh, some of these models as ACOs, accountable care organizations, uh, shared savings programs. So, you have some of those that are uh, risk based uh, arrangements or uh, budget based contracts, 
and you see those some that include upside risk as well as uh, low downside risk. Um, and these are predicated on uh, estimates or um, uh, you know budgets around actual costs uh, for care uh, for either a particular condition or a patient population. Uh, just to give you a little bit more on that in terms of if you know you budget out, you make an estimate of actual cost for care within a, a practice, and that uh, those actual costs uh, exceed what you budgeted uh, for the year, then the the providers of that practice will share in some of the excess. Uh, however, they're not you know responsible for any losses. You know, should uh, the actual cost fall below what that budget is, so that would be the upside risk where. You know they they benefit from the the excess, uh, but they don't they're not responsible for any shortfall. And then alongside that, the downside risk is when they would you know share in those savings in excess of of, of the budget uh, for that year, but they would also uh, bear responsibility as well for any losses. Um, and again, so we see uh, Medicare shared savings programs are a good example of that. Um, incentive payments uh, for alternative payment models. The incentive payments fall into two uh, options that are available. Mm -hmm. And Liz sort of touched on some of this uh, during her portion. Uh, one option is the Medicare threshold, uh, and the second is the all payer threshold. And just a quick note with the all payer threshold that includes uh, all payer payments as well as and uh, Medicare payments. And with the Medicare thresholds, um, this is going to begin sort of in 2019, 2020, with the Medicare thresholds. And you can see here a certain percentage of Medicare payments are attributable to the services furnished uh, to an eligible APM. And then to, I'm sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. In 2019, 2020, that's going to start at 25% for those Medicare uh, payments. And as we saw on the timeline that uh, Liz spoke about uh, in that bottom section, uh, you can see where if the provider exceeds the Medicare payment uh, threshold, they'll get a lump sum 5% uh, bonus. Okay. The all-payer uh, all thresholds, again, it's the all-payer payments as well as the Medicare payments. Uh, that's not, that will begin in 2021. And we'll see uh, in terms of the percentage of uh, payments attributable to the services within that APM, It'll be 50% for all payer and 25% uh, for Medicare uh, payments. And again, uh, if you exceed both the, med the all payer uh, threshold and the Medicare thresholds, uh, you get that lump sum 5% within the APM uh, model. Uh, next is the development of PFPMs or physician focused payment models. Um, just as all this is new for, for everyone, uh, we see we have a little more detail around MIPS and uh, some of the other alternative payment models uh, for these physician-focused payment models. This is still in, still in uh, development, newly proposed. Uh, there's nothing really specifically defined uh, for MACRA. Um, and so they've sort of passed on the job to CMS to sort of help build this out and establish uh, some of the guidelines around this program, around this particular model. And with that, they're sort of forming these committees or technical uh, advisory committees um, to sort of, again, as CMS does with all new sort of proposed rulemaking or, or uh, programs, to sort of seek uh, stakeholder input and get comments on some of the programs. And they'll do that in reviewing, providing recommendations around what they, around what they receive. Okay. And a lot of these, uh, for this particular program, the, any recommendations that are accepted will take uh, will take up to, to a year to two years. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, to, a year to two years uh, to go from the concept uh, phase in developing this uh, uh, to a final model. And so again, CMS is in the process of in the process of uh, developing uh, this particular uh, type of model. And with that, we're going to talk a little bit about the request for information, or RFI, and again, the process that CMS uses around any proposed rulemaking or changes to programs um, that they're seeking, or they, they seek uh, <coughs> stakeholder input and comments. So there's a comment period 
unfortunately for this one, it ended last week, Tuesday, on the 17th at uh, 5 p.m., which was uh, very interesting for our, our, our regional meeting last uh, week because we, again, were at the end of the program and it was probably two o'clock, so we told people you have three hours to get in <laughs> and get your comments in uh, for this program. Um, you can see for, um, for the macro provisions, uh, what they were seeking was input on these following topics. Of course, MIPS and EP, uh, the provider, any identifier exclusions that might be available, uh, the virtual groups, uh, and just interesting with uh, the virtual groups is a program where uh, the performance of one group uh, can be actually tied to the performance of another group despite, you know, or whether, whether or not that group shares the same tax ID number. So I think that's a little interesting from what we're used to with uh, some of the other reporting programs that we're, we've been uh, participating in, uh, for instance, uh, PQRS, uh, where providers that, you know, your performance uh, can be, you know, group-based. However, those providers within that group would have to be, you know, working under the same tax ID number. And some other topics here that they sought uh, input and uh, comments around quality performance category. Again, as uh, Liz uh, pointed out uh, in regards to MIPS, that is uh, what we relate to PQRS uh, reporting. Resource use is the uh, value-based modifier program that sort of attached to PQRS as we know it now. And then you have this here, meaningful use as well. There's flexibility and weighting performance category, so you see uh, Liz touched on that as well. And public reporting. And just continue on specific to, uh, to meaningful use of certified EHR technology, uh, the request for information, sort of, you know, look for comments, uh, comments around some of these questions. Uh, should the performance score uh, for this particular category be based uh, solely on just achievement of meaningful use, as we know today? Uh, should CMS use a tiered methodology? Uh, we see that in some other programs now, uh, even with the uh, the value-based modifier where there's sort of a tiered analysis uh, component of the program. Uh, and then also any alter alternate uh, methodology should CMS use or consider uh, for the performance category. And oh, lastly, how should hardship exemptions be treated? So we saw this last year, uh, 2014, uh, when uh, there was public comment or help for, they put it off for public comment, stakeholder input, around uh, granting hardship exemptions to providers when there might be delays with their EHR, certified EHR technology. Okay. Technical assistance. So this uh, sort of builds on the request for information process, um, asking CMS again, asking for public comment on technical assistance of MIPS. Um, for providers of small practices or practices in uh, HPSAs or health professional shortage areas. Uh, uh, MACRA requires that the Health and Human Services Secretary enter into agreements or contracts with uh, QIOs or uh, RECs, similar to uh, MIHA, which is a regional extension center or REC, in terms of how we can provide assistance to the provider community around uh, participation in these programs as well as regional health uh, collaboratives. Um, so again, we uh, currently, Mihai and some of you are aware, provide assistance around meaningful use and some of the same programs that you're participating in now, uh, you know, and they're sort of combined together with uh, these new programs, um, with meaningful use, PQRS reporting, et cetera. Uh, however, let me just point out that with Mihai, we don't have any restrictions around uh, the size of your practice, the states out here in terms of small practices or these uh, health professional shortage areas, you know, I mean, I will be providing uh, assistance with any MIPS program, APMs, uh, regardless of the size of the practice um, or the you know, number of pro uh, providers within that practice. Um, I'm going to jump to how to prepare for MIPS. Some, some people, I think some, some people are in good shape in terms of preparing for this because again, it, it, it includes a number of the components that you're already uh, participating in. 
Uh, but I would say to start, uh, to start off is, you know, begin having conversations around you know, these programs that are coming down the pipe, you know, within your organizations. Um, what we've seen in, in our experience, I know, you know, our colleagues here have seen the same, uh, is that when we've, when we've worked with uh, different organizations, there are some that are larger and they have the infrastructure or the resources to do this, that forming committees or teams that are going to sort of collaborate to coordinate your efforts around these different reporting programs uh, have proven to be very successful, as opposed to having one person sort of bear the load <laughs> for an entire, yes, I, I see you. <laughs> you know, sort of bearing the whole load for an organization, whether it was a small practice, it's still a lot to take on uh, and coordinate alongside your everyday, you know, regular duties. Um, so getting the conversation started, you know, forming committees or, or groups, or at least having a partner that you can work with within your organization to sort of attack some of this. Um, expand your knowledge base beyond meaningful use, PQRS, and a value-based modifier. Uh, so information coming out, you know, as, as information becomes available, we'll be sharing it. There'll be information posted as well. Um, things around scoring and what and, and how, you know, your providers can best uh, capitalize on these. And then APM participation, you know, what does that involve? What would work for your practice? Is that is a risk-based or budget-based sort of arrangement something that might be feasible for you? Okay. And then, uh, of course, maintaining your current efforts with the programs that you're participating in now, uh, with uh, meaningful use. Uh, it's not something that you let go in, you know, sort of looking ahead to MIPS or APMs. And then, of course, as I mentioned already, contact Mihai um, as one of those uh, regional extension centers or RECs that, um, that uh, they'll be contracting with to provide assistance. You know, we'll be there as well to uh, provide some of the assistance that we're providing now. Again, which is a sort of, sorry. Oh. Should a question? Oh, no, no, I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. Oh, feel free if you, if you want to jump in. Um, so again, just some of these same services that we're providing now around the programs, um, you know, you can always reach out to us uh, as well for those. Okay, again, uh, looking at preparing for MIPS, uh, Liz laid out uh, pretty well in terms of some of the charts we have here around what's making up um, some of the score scores for MIPS. And you know, together, quality and resource use groups, as we saw, make up 60%. So it's more than half of, of what your, uh, of your MIPS composite score will be. As we know, uh, quality, that's PQRS. And resource use is, is pretty much related to the value-based modifier. So these are things that you know, if you're, you're working on now, things that we can provide assistance around now, uh, that's, a, that's a huge part of your success in these programs going forward, the things that you're working on now. And some of the advice that we give now around PQRX, you know, uh, starting out early, select your measures, you know, what you're going to report on, getting organized around the data that's going to be uh, needed for those, for those measures that you report, uh, performing dry runs uh, in terms of your reporting and how that's going to look for, uh, different, uh, for your performance with different providers. And then improve, improve provider performance. Um, we see in some cases where uh, where you can, uh, particularly an, uh, an example would be a PQRS. Uh, a program like this is where you know some providers' performance, you know, as you're going as a group, particularly as an APM, where your one provider's uh, performance can sort of or lack of performance can pull down the entire group. So other considerations like maybe thinking about uh, maybe eliminating that provider from that from your reporting, if you can weigh the sort of the, the cost of what that penalty might be for that one provider versus how much it's going to cost the entire group with their performance. Things to keep in uh, keep in mind. Uh, next here is uh, meaningful use. Like it makes up 25 percent of your MIPS composite score. Um, so things around that, preparing for meaningful use, attestation. A lot of you are doing that now. Um, and that's something that we, of course, we provide assistance around. Uh, reviewing the final rule, modifications. You have, uh, you know, two years now that you're going to have of a single set of objectives and measures that you can work with. Um, instead of, you know, there won't be a change next year. 
in terms of what you make checkers. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. Thank you. Hopefully. We have it in writing, 2015 and 2017. Uh, and of course, stage three coming down the pike in, uh, in 18. Uh, resolving registration issues ahead of time. That's an issue that we see all the time, uh, particularly when you have turnover in staff at an organization. Uh, make sure that providers are registered properly. Uh, making sure that whoever is going to be coordinating your efforts around uh, these programs, particularly meaningful use, that uh, you have a, an office manager or a practice manager that is uh, designated or is a designee and uh, you know authorized to attest on the behalf of your providers. So getting all that uh, registration uh, work taken care of ahead of time. Uh, being prepared for potential audits, something that we preach now for meaningful use. Uh, as you know, the rules you want to any supporting documentation that's required uh, for meaningful use is something that you have to maintain on file for six years. That is what you have to do. Um, for any of you that are enrolled with us, uh, members of MEHI, uh, you know we have a member portal that you would have access to. And within that member portal, there is what we call secure document storage. And so beyond what you may save on your you know, desktop or whatever, any supporting documentation uh, around your attestation application for meaningful use. Uh, we uh, recommend that you save those documents within a secure document storage within your portal. It's something that will be available there. Uh, me, high, particularly if in the Medicaid program, we're contracted with MassHealth as a third party that sits well in terms of the audit process uh, as well. And in the event that there is turnover in your organization, uh, how many times do we see where people are new and they're saying, you know, I don't have access to what files were there, the person, you know, before me. I don't know what they say, I don't know how to get access to it. Well, your, your organization is enrolled with MEHI as a member, you're a new staff, we're going to give you uh, your login for your organization's uh, uh, supporting documentation within our member portal. And it'll be there available. Um, and you can expand your meaningful use knowledge base within your organization. The funny term here, as you can see, uh, MU is a program, not a person. Uh, so it's something that's evolving. We talked about the landscape in health IT, how it's very complex. We understand how difficult it is. It's forever changing. Uh, and I mentioned embracing stability, we hope. Two years right now, of, uh, uh, two full years of stable objectives and uh, measures. Uh, just going forward again, just sort of just been talking about this as I've been going along, but just, you know, where MEHI can play a role um, with any of these new programs, MIPS, APMs coming down the pike, and then even now with this meaningful use, PCRS reporting as well, that's what we're tasked with. We have that charge here in the state to uh, provide assistance to uh, providers, you know, throughout the, the Commonwealth. Um, and um, so just navigating that, that landscape. And in case you don't know, and I kind of mentioned it a little bit myself here, but just some of the things that we do do uh, here at MEHI, again, uh, meaningful use support uh, uh, includes things like the meaningful use gap analysis, seeing where you are currently versus what the thresholds are that you have to meet. And when we identify those gaps, you know, providing you with help around how you can sort of close those gaps and, and exceed those, those uh, thresholds. I mentioned secure document storage, audit preparation, very important. It will be very important going forward with uh, MIPS and uh, APMs as well. Uh, as some of the components included right here, what we're already providing for service. Uh, PQRS reporting as well. We have a qualified registry for reporting um, where it's just one of many methods that are available for reporting. Uh, but, but I will say that uh, reporting PQRS measures through a qualifying registry affords you additional uh, options for reporting. Just a quick example about that is, you know, doing your PQRS reporting through claims-based reporting, something that's very tedious with your billing, is a constant uh, practice that you have to maintain with the different codes, et cetera. A lot of times we have, and I've, I've been approached two times at least today, where someone came to me and said that, you know, asking questions about PQRS reporting because their EHR vendor is still not ready to does have them set up for reporting directly through their EHR. Again, the qualified registry is going to 
uh, is available for you to report through as well. And again, just another note on PPRS before we get off of it <laughs> is, uh, is that, uh, you know, when you're reporting uh, through claims-based or direct through EHR, it, it requires you to report on more than 50%, more than half of all your eligible instances for the year. If you report through a qualified registry, there is, a, there is the uh, potential for only having to report on a panel of 20 patients per provider. And with, the, and with those 20 patients, they don't have to all be, only a majority, 11, have to be uh, traditional Medicare Part B. The remaining uh, nine or so can be of any other insurance, commercial insurance, whatever. So it's something to keep in mind for those that are uh, seeing Medicare uh, patients. And then of course, Mihai, we collaborate with other uh, partners that we work with closely. Uh, I just facilitated earlier uh, a breakout session around privacy and security, and that was uh, presented by uh, Ryan Patrick, who works with Blueprint uh, Healthcare IT. Um, they work very closely with us. We utilize their Security Connect tool to help providers uh, conduct their security risk analysis uh, around privacy and security. So. And then other tools as well, other resources that we work with uh, around patient engagement and other areas as well. And then of course, uh, thought leadership. Um, again, we're tasked with providing assistance and that includes education as well. So we're doing things, and some of you know, some of the webinars we conduct on various topics, some of the workshops we've conducted, and then these regional meetings that we put on uh, last week and as well as today that have been you know, very helpful around the different topics that people have to deal with around uh, health IT. Okay, with that, we will open it up to questions.